What's up, guys? Welcome back to the channel. I'm excited today because I'm here with HS Tack, the creator and writer of uh, Red Shift from Scout Comics. I recently did a, a review of this first issue that'll be out uh, later in May, but uh, I want to give him the opportunity to introduce himself. So, who are you and uh, what do you do? Hey, everybody. Uh, first, thanks for having me on, Ryan. Um, my name is Himkar S. Tak. Uh, I write a few comic books here and there. I had one uh, come out with IDW and I think it was 2016 called Boy One. Uh, and it took a little bit of time, but luckily I have a new one coming out uh, with Scout called Redshift. Uh, and I'm excited to be here. You know, I had read, you sent me like the digital copy of Red Shift. And so I had read that. I really enjoyed it. And then you uh, shipped over this awesome uh, ash can. Oh, look, is that a fan in the back? <laughs> um, you know, so I really enjoyed the book. I thought it was great. And you worked with uh, Brett McKee on this. So I guess like, how did this idea come about? Where did y'all come up with this? Oh man, the idea, um, it's hard to say where it came, where it started from. Brent Brent came on once I pitched him um, the story. Uh, the idea came, you know, I just, I, I've always loved sci-fi. It's hard not to get inspired when you watch different, you know, all the different media, um, read different books, Jeff Lemire books, uh, watching shows like Battlestar Galactica, uh, Star Wars, not the not the newer ones, but you know the older ones. Um, so space has always been, you know, I've always been enamored with it. Um, I tried to catch, you know, I guess you know when you're a little kid and you're li lying out in the field on a summer night and you look up and you see the universe out there. Uh, I, I sort of wanted to capture that wonder, and so. The idea of doing a book in space is always, you know, it's always been in the back of my head. Yeah, to capture a little of that, a little of that wonder in this book. Yeah, I mean that's what I really liked about Redshift is uh, the entire basis of like the story that we're being told, like I guess in the current timeline in this book, is uh, that of a voyager, somebody who's sent out amongst the stars to try to find. Um, you know, somewhere else for humans to go to continue to exist, you know? And so I think it does like it very much because I'm the same way. Like I'm really into space and sci-fi stuff, you know, and um, I grew up, I, I loved uh, like astronomy and the stars. And, um, you know, my parents took me out to the McDonald Observatory out in West Texas when I was a kid mm -hmm. and stuff. And so like the stars in space is something that's always interested me because, I feel like, you know, the most questions we as a species will ever ask, you know, all of those questions are in the stars and that's also where all the answers lie, you know? And so to me, space naturally evokes kind of this uh, investigative, intriguing, uh, curious nature. And so when you put this book like on Mars, but they need to get away from here, they need to find somewhere else to go. I think the idea of the Voyager is just like, infinitely interesting because they're going out there to find those things for us there's always um when you're out there in the field and you look up i think the main question i had when i was a kid was you know first you feel really small um and you understand like you're just a speck right not even a speck smaller than that and you look out and you see all these star systems and you always wonder what else is out there like who who else is out there? Are they are they looking at the stars too and wondering the same things I am? So I think that root, you know, kernel uh, of wonder of what is out there is the main, probably the main theme of of redshift and the main, you know, the main question um, that drives it. What else is out and, there, and is it similar? And you know, how do we, how do we meld us and them? Yeah. 
Yeah, I really like uh, the way you set this story because you went ahead and you put us like in the future and we're on Mars. So like you don't have to deal with any of the heavy lifting of like how do humans get off of Earth? How does, um, you know, like how does all this work? Like can they make it somewhere else? Like they've already made it to Mars, you know, so we know that the humans can continue to propagate, you know, they just need to find somewhere else to go. And so I think it creates this really interesting dynamic because, you know, so many people were running, you know, their stories are running from earth because it's being destroyed. But we're at this point now in this story where it's kind of 2.0, they went to Mars and um, they're running out of resources. And, and that's the big problem, you know, that they're trying to solve is we need more resources. We need somewhere else to go. And so I think it makes it really interesting because you kind of like can jump right into the middle of all the sci-fi and you don't have to explain like, uh, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, you know, I thought that was a, a cool movie for the most part, but they spend a lot of time in that movie setting up the idea that humans like can leave the planet and stuff, you know, and they spend a lot of time focused on that. Whereas your story here, we don't have to worry about any of that heavy lifting. We're already in space. We've already colonized things. And, and now it's purely about the exploration from there. Yeah. And this, uh, I just felt it was better just to, we already ran from earth. So we, um, at this point in humanity, we're trying to survive on Mars. Um, it was really interesting. I was able to work with uh, NASA JPL, uh, a scientist there who's the head of their exoplanet exploration program named Dr. Wesley Traub. And he sort of helped me ground the science of what it's, what it's gonna be like if you live on Mars um, and uh, what was super interesting is that the guys at NASA, um, they, they, they're working on and studying and believe in things that if we were to talk about it, it doesn't, for the average person, uh, would never think it was even considered in the realm of possibility. But they are working on um, a travel system that could go interstellar. Right, and to to trend to tra traverse that amount of light years is is crazy if you think about it. But they are actually they actually believe that space time continuum can be bent, and you could travel uh, super far away, you know, like galaxies away. Yeah. So, um, and they have that belief. They really believe it. They believe that it's it's possible. It's just a matter of figuring out how to do it. Um, so it was cool to just see basically, you know, things that you watch and you dream about as a kid, they're actually applying it and trying to figure out how to solve these problems. Um, now, specifically for, for Redshift, it's um, the colonization of Mars is interesting because as, as we were writing the book, I think we started like three years ago. Um, and the amount of science that we're gaining from Mars is continuously changing and updating because there's just so much new info that NASA has been gathering. Uh, when I first started the book, there were, you know, we were discussing that there probably isn't any water on Mars, or if there was, it's going to be very difficult to get. Now we know like there's, there's lakes of ice uh, in the North and South polar caps. So water would be in what used to be an issue. It's still an issue. Like how do we gather it and how do we harvest it? And how do we use it um, in a sustainable way for, for if there was any life on Mars, but um, the, the changes that we've been seeing um, just based off the science of Mars is, is amazing in just a short amount of time. Yeah. I think I had just seen a headline recently where they made another big discovery as far as uh, water and stuff on Mars. So that's really interesting, but uh, you applied that here because um, they work in a uh, ice vein mine. So yeah, so they're on Mars, like uh, digging up the ice. Yeah, so that wasn't part. That was added after that the discovery of the the north and south southern polar caps of Mars contained ice. So that informed and changed the story a bit. Um, there's, you know, I don't know. There's there's other things I discussed with them that's interesting. Um, if you think about it, if you if humans were to try and live on Mars, we would not have a democratic society. 
right? It, it just wouldn't work up there because it, right now we're already fighting over the abundant resources we have on Earth, right? When there are no resources, imagine how aggressive people would be towards each other trying to, you know, fight for those resources. Mm-hmm. So on Mars, it really would be like a, um, the way I'd like to think about it is like a, it's like a interesting crazy meld of like a North Korea, um, that type of dictatorship mixed with science, right? So science is informing the top decision makers and then it has to flow down uh, in almost like a, like a military would because every, every person there would have to have a job um, and all their, their, their jobs would have to be towards one focus, which is to sustain life and extend life on Mars because mm-hmm. every day you're like, you know, every day is basically how do we extend life a little bit further from today? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're in these, um, you know, very crazy situations, at least where technology currently is. So I do like, I think of uh, like colonization and space travel at this point, I kind of see it as like this hybrid of like, you know, what SpaceX is doing, like these kind of independent corporations making a lot of these leaps and strides. But even if you went out into space, you would have to have a more militaristic structure because you need that chain of command to keep everybody alive. You know, everybody can't be making decisions, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, exactly. That's kind of how I think about it is like, it would probably be part corporate and part like government military kind of stuff to get us to that point. Yeah. It, it is like it is today. Um, but once you're, once you're there, then it's gotta be, it's gotta be a, pretty autocratic type of ruling system you know the order comes down and the order is is followed and if it's not followed it's going to be a problem because that means something you know something won't it's it's not going to be towards that goal of extending what they think will be extending um, life on mars yeah um i think that's a really cool point though because in this book we sort of have a um I guess more or less like a Hunger Games kind of scenario where they um, have a lottery basically that's kind of like picking people from different uh, outposts and stuff to become these voyagers and go out into the stars. And the title is handed over with a lot of honor, but that even gets interesting because the, the main character and his family have already lost uh, one person to this lottery system, you know, and so it puts a lot of pressure on him going into it. Yeah, I mean, you touched on. Um, did, were you the? Did, are you the one who came up with Hunger Games slash Interstellar? Was Probably. That, I think yeah, I, I definitely great, referenced uh, Hunger Games. I gotta as have a lottery. you pitch my books, man. <laughs> you got. You're gonna be. I'm gonna call you for my next pitch. <laughs> um, awesome. Yeah. So in this, it is. It does remind me of hu- Hunger Games, definitely. Um, and definitely, that movie was out when I first started writing it. So I'm sure it was uh, an influence. Um, So it's not as much as of a lottery system as he was, there's different colonies that serve the purpose of extending life on Mars for humanity. So he's part of the mining colony. Um, I guess just like Katniss Everdeen, what was she? She was in a mining colony too. But so he was chosen because um, he was the best astronaut at the youngest age they could find because you have to be young to go on this journey because a lot of time elapses um, when you go and come back uh, just due to the how far they go out into the universe so he was chosen um, obviously and then there's his history that you know he's he's the son also of a voyager that was chosen so it complicates things uh, with his family Um, voyagers so far have never come back you know, so yeah, it definitely has that feel. Um, and it adds a complexity for Helena to make the choice. Like, do I really want to leave my family um, after a family member had j- just left 10 years prior? Yeah, I thought it was uh, an excellent choice. It creates a lot of great tension because you have like the younger brother who doesn't really seem to understand too much. And then you have the dad that's very angry because he's already lost his wife and now they're asking him to give up more. 
Yeah. And uh, like you said, none of the Voyagers have come back. And so the main character, um, you know, he does struggle a lot with like he lost his mom to this system and um, he's left this. Uh, I don't know what exactly that group, I guess, kind of like the military group. He kind of retired from that and um, he's in a weird place. And now he's be, been chosen to to become a very prestigious uh, person within their society, you know, and um, that creates a lot of great internal conflict and switches us over to this great flashback that uh, kind of explains to us why he's uh, kind of messed up at this point. Yeah, and that that flashback. So basically, um, the the colonel, like the the main, I guess, the main character of this story is Helena, and he's the the challenge he has is he went through this training accident and 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 you know, astronaut training for cadet training um, where he suffered a trauma, right? Of, of a severe tragic loss. So he has PTSD from it. So it's basically the story of uh, an astronaut who gets chosen, who has PTSD and he knows he's, he believes he's not the right choice, but um, the ministry that, that sends these voyagers out um, on these super important missions uh, really believe that he is the right choice. So, yeah, you know, I really like that conversation because he's very revealing in like how prestigious this is in the society. Yeah, it, it is, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to screw up. Right. And if, if you're out there and you have PTSD, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult obstacle um, because again, just like if you're on Mars, but if you're in outer space, every decision is, is important and will either shorten or extend your life. Um, so, so Helena has to, I mean, at some point he's going to have to get over his, his, his trauma and what happened in the past, um, in order to be successful in this journey. So that's yeah. the, set up there early. Yeah, and that's really interesting because, like, he almost seems like he's not necessarily dealing very well with, like, normal life. And so I think that's kind of part of his hesitation with being a Voyager is, like, he feels like he's not qualified. But then at the same time, like, in that flashback, we see, like, this guy is very much uh, very good in a crisis. Like, he's very level-headed, yeah, exactly. and he knows and how to, like, chosen. put things together. Yeah. So, so I feel like he himself doesn't see that. So he's he would be excellent in space. Like this dude knows how to handle himself. Yeah, that's uh, that's the crux of his um, his problem, right? He doesn't he doesn't think, you know, he doesn't want to have this trauma of the past. See, this basically this trauma of the past is like a ghost, right? That that could come up at any time, and uh, screw things up for them. Once you're out there, you can't, you know, you got to be of stable mind and body uh, to conduct all the tasks that need to get taken care of and to, in order to have a successful mission. Um, so this, the, this, this past trauma is like a ghost for him. It's going to, you know, it's going to come out at some point and is he going to be able to face it or is it going to tank this, this uh, this journey. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that unfolds. And um, I guess, like, how far out is this story? How far do you... This was the first one. I was really impressed. I'm excited to read more of it. Um, it's going to be... Right now, it's it's six, six books. Um, and then there's obviously, you know, at the end, you, you got the little cliffhanger for the second, the second volume. So that'll be there too. Um, so we'll see how far, you know, we'll see how far it gets, but definitely, um, for this run, for this arc, it'll be, it'll be six, six books. Cool. And, um, you know, I thought I had seen some kind of ad or something some months back about uh Kickstarter. So it made sense when you sent it over and it was, uh, a scout book, but you said y'all never went to Kickstarter. So this is, um, uh, an original piece from uh, scout. 
Uh, yeah, it was, I actually, I bought it to Scout. Um, so actually Scout, um, interestingly, Scout, uh, Scout reached out to me through um, James Pruitt, who worked, who worked there, heard about the book from his brother who worked at Aftershock. Um, and so they saw they were they saw a copy of it uh, of the first issue, but a really old sort of um, not as refined, unrefined raw copy of it. Uh, what I'd usually do when I'm pitching is I, I I make a book and I, I I try and do like the first if I can chapter, but at least like the first ten pages or the first um, enough of it to see the the main character who the main character is. Um, I think all these things have to be character based. And then I print it out. And at that time you could walk around cons and hand out the book, right? So that's how I, I would do it. That's how I did Boy One um, at first. Uh, I know it's difficult to do it now that way because a lot of times they don't um, they don't want to take handouts at, at conventions. A lot of people aren't. Uh, it helps if you get introduced to you know, the, the editors or the presidents of the companies there. But yeah, that's what I did. And so they, Scott contacted me, Brendan Deneen contacted me and James Pruitt contacted me from Scout about the book. And um, at that point, I'd never been contacted by any, it's always me, you know, chasing, trying to get someone to look at my pitch, look at my book. So I was like, damn, that's awesome. And yeah. I couldn't be happier, Scouts. Um, Scout's a great place because they're just guys like us, man, who love comics. That's that's what it that's what it comes down to. They just love books. They love comic books and they love the medium. So it makes everything easier um, to try and you know get the deal done and get the book out there. Yeah, I uh, recently talked with uh, Jordan Thomas, who did uh, Frank on, Frank at Home on the Farm. Yeah, um, and that like was Kickstarter. Simple. Yeah, and now it's going through Scout and. That's kind of how he described it too. Is like Scout was um, really easy to work with because they're they're comic book fans first and foremost, and so what they're trying to do is get books out there on the shelf and get them in front of people because they want people to enjoy this. But there's not like this big ulterior motive of like we need to get this IP and we need to hold on to this, you know? Because no, I've okay. talked to a couple of like Kickstarter creators who have like partnered with publishers and then at that point you're kind of beholden to that publisher and and jordan was telling me like with scout if he wants to do more kickstarters of frankie at home like they have no issue because they really just want to put it on a shelf in a, a store so that other eyes can see it because it's a whole separate audience so yeah, yeah it sounds they're, like they're really easy to work with as a creator they're awesome they don't they don't worry about that kind of they just want i mean the more people that see the book they see that as value so they don't mind. Um, I think they probably encourage you to do quick Kickstarter if you need to, um, or you know, however you want it. To, you know, Charlie Stickney, um, who's a, a writer and also a publisher at Scout, has a new book called Glarian, um, and they did a phenomenal Kickstarter for it. But it's also going to come out through Scout. Um, so even though he's um, sort of capitalized on the audience that's already paying for the Kickstarter, um, he's still, you know, Scout's still excited and it's going to do well there too um, with their market. So they, they, they don't look at it as like cannibalizing other market segments. They don't, they don't really care about that. They just want to, like you said, get the book out in the stands and get as many people to read interesting st stories as they can. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool what Scout's doing. They've uh, really blown up lately, and um, I really like their box. I think their box is a great value. And uh, do you know if Red Shift's going to be in that? I don't know. Let's ask them. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Yeah, because everybody loves the uh, Scout box every month, and they tend to put almost everything they're publishing. So okay, it'd be yeah. exciting if everybody could get Red Shift uh, in a box, you know. Yeah, if you can't get it your box, just, um, I don't know, you can find us on Instagram or you can go to scott.com, ask yeah, a comic book store. Yeah, I know a lot of people struggle with, um, you know, there's a lot of like these more rural shops and stuff that have a, they don't really order 
um, like indie books or especially like Scout and stuff because they're so small. Um, so I think it's cool that they have like a subscription box that goes out every month. And so if you're one of those people that can't get a hold of Scout books any other way, that's definitely an awesome way to uh, be able to get them delivered to you. And now they have a, you can look out for it. I don't know where they are, but they have vending machines. I don't know if you've oh, seen really? that. Yeah, they have yeah. vending machines with a bunch of, just loaded with a bunch of books, just like you're ordering a Gatorade or a Coke. Oh, you, wow. You put a couple of dollars in and you get a book. Yeah. That's awesome. I didn't sure even know they that. Are, they, have, they have like a number of them. I think they have a, a handful of them just out and about somewhere. I'll have to find oh, out wow. where. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, you also sent me uh, this other book, Boy One. Yeah, so that's that's the first book I did at IDW. And I, I flipped through it, and I really like the art. Um, it reminds me of uh, Red Shift and that it's like this kind of like gritty, um, you know, like it's very good artwork, but at the same time it's got like this gritty, almost like noirish kind of tone to it, I guess. Yeah, that's um, – Amanke Nahopan, uh, and he's uh, he's now an artist for, he does uh, Justice League Dark. He's done a bunch of DC books. He won the DC Talent Award in 2018. Oh, nice. Um, for, as an artist, uh, he's amazing, man. He's blowing up and he's, he's just a brilliant artist. You can just see him page after page, just drips with energy and like, you know, he has that noir dark feel to a lot of his work. Um, he was the cover artist for the main cover for Redshift. Um, and we have another book coming out uh, pretty soon. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah, probably 2000. It'll probably be published next year. Oh, okay. And like these two artists, I mean, their styles are completely different worlds apart, but there are like some similar elements to them. Um, I guess like, what do you look for in a collaborator? How did you uh, meet Brent McKee and uh, your artist over here. You know, I can't. So I, think, I think for Brent, I was introduced through to another artist um, through Zach Howard, who does a lot of, um, he does Hellboy and he does a lot. He did Wild Blue Yonder for IDW. He's a, he's a great, great artist. Um, and he couldn't do my book, but he suggested I look at Brent McKee's work. And I did. Uh, Brent had worked on some image books. He did some stuff for Dark Horse. Um, he never did his own book, though, his own, you know, creator own type book. So I pitched him Redshift. Um, and, you know, he was really good at doing Westerns. And I feel like if you look at Red, Redshift, it is it is basically like a Western, right? If, if you look at it, it's it just has that feel to it. The characters' expressions, the way their the body language, um, the way that the the scenes are sh are set up. It's like a Sergio Leone out, out in space, right? So I don't know. I thought he was he was a good match for it. He loved the idea. Um, and you're out, you know, you're out on a new frontier. So you're out in the the wild west. Uh, some someday is going to be Mars. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting comparison because um, they live in like these harsh, brutal environments, you know, much like uh, the Cowboys did. And uh, it does like the way they interact and stuff reminds me of a Western. It kind of reminds me, um, you know, of something more like uh, like Lonesome Dove, where yeah. um, they're going out into an adventure instead of like somebody coming into their town. But it definitely has like those Western adventure vibes because of the, the harsh environment and the unique circumstances that, you know, you have to exist in. It's crazy. Yeah. Every time you go outside, you got to put on like a mask and a helmet and everything so you can get oxygen. Like yeah, that's completely it, different from the world we live in, you know? But what um, a lot of people don't realize is um, depending on where you are on Mars, you could get a day that's 60 degrees, right? So you could be in a t-shirt uh, if you're out on the plains. You could be in a t-shirt, but you still need your helmet. And the other thing is you just better make sure you get back home by nightfall because that's when the temperature will drop. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. That uh, changes everything for society, you know. So... um. Yeah. 
why don't you tell me what is boy one about because I, I flipped through it i haven't had time to read it it just came in yesterday but uh this is idw yeah so boy one um boy one was out 2016 um it's i think it was 2016 it came out um boy one explores the creation and aftermath of making the first human clone this is the basic pitch so um this it's about this geneticist who works at a at a bioengineering company and he discovers that he's been like the the lifelong experiment of the company that he works for and when he tries to break away the company tightens its grip because he's basically like a commodity um there's no one else in the planet like him so uh Interestingly, also it deals with a global pandemic in this, in the sense that he was given um, his in his DNA, uh, his DNA is able to withstand a new virus that uh, that has been created and unleashed on the world. So he's the only one who can withstand it. So every country in the world is going to be looking for him because they're they want the cure the fast track cure for this virus. So he, when he goes on the run, basically every country starts looking, hunting him. So what? that's what it is in a nutshell. Yeah. It was interesting. Yeah, it came out interesting. now. Yeah. Yeah. With what's going it's on. It's weird. Like how much, uh, you know, how many things came out, you know, like a comic book doesn't come out the next day, you know, it takes time to develop these things and get them made. Yeah. And, it's crazy how many like kind of like pandemic adjacent stories have been coming out. Just even if you look back to like 2016 till now, you know, all these books are coming out. People were right. writing these ideas before the event actually happened, you know? Yeah. I don't know, man. It's just, I guess it's on, you know, it's in the, the, the global subconscious, you know? Right. Like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Hopefully I don't write about, or we don't start writing about nuclear war or something like I know, right? <laughs> devastating. Yeah. Although the pandemic was as as bad as probably you can get, you know. Yeah. Um, how many issues was uh, Boy One? Uh, Boy One was was uh, four issues. It's a small, small little book, small little arc. Cool. Yeah. And is it available in trade or? Uh... Yeah, you can get it. It's a trade. It was a trade paperback. I'm not sure. It it might be all gone by now, but. Um, you maybe check Amazon. I've seen them on Amazon from time to time or barnesandnobles.com. I'm sure that some are floating out there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Comicsology. Yeah. Yeah. You can definitely get on the comicsology, okay. the digital. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's very cool. And um, I guess like, what are you looking forward to in the future? Do you have more projects on the horizon? Or are you uh, yeah, working I do, with Scout man. again? I, I do. I have another book with uh, Amake coming. Um, which is a historical fiction. So it's a little bit of a, a break from doing the, the hard sci-fis. Um, and it's basically, uh, it's called Crashland and it takes place in 1940s uh, in a place called the NWFP, which is the Northwest Frontier Provinces, uh, which is the border of Afghanistan and India. And it's about a little 10 uh, year old street orphan who finds a wounded um, British Royal Air Force fighter pilot in the mountains. And this area is hostile towards the British because they've seen India colonized by the British and they don't want to be colonized. So there's basically a bounty on his head from all the different tribal groups and warlords that live there. And this girl is like, if I can save him, travel the Silk Route back to the Khyber Pass, which is a British stronghold on the border of India, then the British will give me a better life. So so she, him and her go on this journey together, um, really dangerous journey uh, over um, in the, the Silk Road, basically. So it's oh, wow. a cool historical, historical piece. That's really cool. Uh, is history something you're into or? Yeah, history. So yeah, 
I'm just into good stories, man. Anything, anywhere, anywhere I can try and find a story, I'll, I'll try and yeah. tell. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, I just didn't know if like history was something that interests you and that's where that came from or if you like uh, heard about it and did all the research for it specifically. Yeah, it's a mix of both. I heard about pilots flying over um, that area because at the time, historically speaking, um, Afghanistan was kind of uh, in limbo. It's not a place that you hear about um, during World War II, you know, given the Axis and allies, it's a kind of an unforgotten land, but the Germans were supplying them with weapons so they can be a, a hassle towards the border of India. Um, India was Britain's crown jewel. It was its most uh, important asset. They were, they were getting the most money they could out of India. Um, so the, the, so the Germans were like, let's, let's keep that area of Afghanistan riled up and angry and aggressive because it's going to, it's going to cause Britain to focus resources on it during a war. So that was taking place uh, politically uh, at the time. And so Britain would be sending, you know, pilots into the area just to do recon and stuff like that. And so this is just a story born out of that um, period in history that sort of overlooked and forgotten about because they weren't the major, you know, they weren't a ma in, the, in the major conflict at the time. They were just on the sidelines. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. So, yeah. so you find this story and you kind of develop it. What does that look like? Do you, uh, do you write like an actual comic script or are you just kind of like putting together elements before you find a collaborator? Yeah, these, um, so I went, so my, I went to school, I went to NYU grad school for screenwriting, uh, probably like 2005 I graduated, maybe 2006, maybe 2007. Um, but yeah, so this actually both Redshift and Crash End came out of screenplays that I wrote um, that basically hadn't gotten anywhere. Either they're too big or they're, they're, I don't know, whatever the reason was, they're just, you know, a story by a 10-year-old, you know, brown girl in Afghanistan is difficult for Hollywood to, to digest and make. Um, mm -hmm. So I was like, what are the, what are different ways I can get these stories out? And comics, I always loved comics and it was just, it made sense to go the, in that direction. And so basically they were already sort of pre-written, but you have to translate them into comic books. I have another book um, that's also going to be coming out probably next year uh, that takes, it's actually another historical book, uh, takes place in 16th century Japan. Um, and I, that one I can't talk too much about because it's, it's under NDA, but um, again, that's another historical book um, that's not based on a screenplay. That's just, based on history, basically a piece of history yeah. that, found that you can then go explore and try and, you know, uh, manufacture the story. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That's really cool. Um, I talked to a lot of people that, you know, they've been doing the screenwriting thing or they're trying to do the screenwriting thing. And, um, you know, it, it's a tough world to break into and, um, I also listened to Ryland Grant and Dave Avalone. They have mm -hmm. a podcast called Writer's Block. And uh, both of them are kind of in the same places like you, you know. They, they're they screenwriters and they've done plenty of work for like Hollywood and stuff. Most of it doesn't even have their name on it. But they they both talk quite a bit about how they got to this point where it was like they were developing these scripts and people would look at them and say, this is good, but we can't we can't make this movie because it won't sell because it's not like one of five movies basically. And uh, that's kind of how they migrated over to comics is because it's so impossible to break into Hollywood because there's so many gatekeepers. There's only certain types of movies that will sell. And so a lot of their bigger ideas and their crazier ideas, they took to Kickstarter and comic books in general. And that's how they've been getting those things made. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the best writers I know is uh, Jeff Lemire. And I think he had a film background first. Uh, I'm not sure he couldn't break in. I'm sure he could break in wherever he wanted to. Uh, but it's just, I don't know. I think you fall in love with comics and you just you just run with it. 
um, which is what happened with me is I don't really miss what I don't miss and what I never had, you know what I mean? I just love comics. So it makes sense now just keep keep going with with comics and uh, screenwriting is cool too, but it's it's not as fun because you can't always see it come to light. Um, but with comics, you can. So it just makes more sense and it's more satisfying right now. Yeah, no doubt. It's, uh, you know, comics have really exploded since, I guess, probably like the the 2000s when Image kind of broke, you know, broke good ground with creating these, uh, like, I guess, like indie comics that aren't really connected to the whole superhero thing or like these big universes. You know, they started focusing on telling these stories and having these series that were just about, you know, anything, you know, basically like TV or movies. And so I'm really excited because something like Red Shift probably couldn't have existed 20 years ago because it's not superhero based, you know, and that's what comics was for many, many years, you know. But I think where we're at now, I'm, I'm really excited because it gives us this uh, renaissance of comics. People are more interested than ever because there's so much great content out there because it doesn't all have to be attached to uh, Marvel or DC or superheroes in general, you know? Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. Look at all the shows and, and just all the movies that are coming out. They're all based on comics. Um, comics is definitely in, you know, I know they had the golden age, um, but maybe now they're coming to the new, I don't know, platinum age. seems like definitely there's a resurgence. Um, it went through a dip, I guess, in the 80s, 90s, right? And then Image came out and then, but now it's definitely back. And, you know, how do you not love comics, man? I think yeah. everyone loves comics. They, they, you know, they just can get a book and crack it open. Yeah, I love it. It's uh, such an engaging medium as a reader. You know, you can put on a movie or TV in the background and, uh, you know, kind of forget it's even there. And uh, with comics, like, because you have to read, it's so engaging and it keeps you interested, you know, and that, that's what I love about it as a medium. And, um, you know, I hear a lot of creators like they they love it to create. And it's just like a lot of fun. It's very interesting. And like you said, like the pipeline's not so crazy. You can take an idea and turn it into something much easier no, and much faster yeah. than a movie. Yeah, man, it's the best. Like if you talk to I'm sure any writer will tell you the best you know, the best is like when you open that inbox and you get new art from your <laughs> artist. That's, it's like Christmas morning every time that happens. Yes, that, that's what everybody says. They're like, you know, there's so many things in life that get old after so many times, but like getting your first uh, like comps of a book or the first time you get art from your artist that that, that really uh, brings your, your characters or your world to life. Like it's, it's like Christmas morning every time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, is there uh, anything else you want to put out there? You want to let everybody know where to find you? And uh, Redshift comes uh, out at the end of May, right? Yeah, it comes out May 19th. Uh, and if you can find me on Instagram mainly, uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook too, but it's at HSTronic. Awesome. Um, yeah, we talked about the boy that's on Comixology, and uh, maybe there's some trades still left in print. Um, Redshift is out May 19th, so that's exciting. I really enjoyed this book, and I'm excited to see where the rest of this series goes. And then, uh, of course, I'm excited to see what you have in the future. Man, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I love how much you love comics, too, So, and how much you like space and sci-fi. So hopefully, you know, it scratches that itch for you. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. It was uh, exciting to talk.